Excellent. Okay, week six, RLS seven. Welcome, everyone. I'm going to go through our standard reminders and then kick off the call completely. So um, RLS has a code of conduct. This generally means that we ask everyone to treat each other with respect in the way that you would like to be treated uh, by other people. Um, if at any point you experience or witness anything that's not in line with the code of conduct, then please email either a team at openlifesci.org or one of the OLS members individually. Um, our emails are in line 64 of the Etherpad, which uh, people have been posting into the chat, and I'm sure we posted again briefly. Um, we also have otter.ai transcription, which means that you can follow along, for example, if you're hard of hearing, or if you get distracted easily, or if you're um, unable to use your sound, any of those, um, and probably other ones I haven't thought of. If you click on the top left of your screen, at least that's how it views on my desktop, um, where it says Otto AI, click here to open live transcript, and there's a machine automatically transcribing what we say. Apologies for any weird things where the machine does misinterpret it. When we put this online um, on YouTube, we correct our captions uh, to make sure that it doesn't do things like call fair data fairy dust, um, which, yes, it has done in the past. <laughs> um, when we have breakout rooms, we will ask people to also edit your Zoom name. Um, so because we have two types of breakout rooms in the call, we have written breakout rooms, which allows people to participate via uh, writing rather than speaking. Um, and we also offer spoken breakout rooms. Um, so actually, I'll ask very quickly now, if you can, uh, to just rename yourselves. This makes it very easy to um, sort you into breakout rooms. So to do that, what I do on my on my computer, I click on participants. And then on the participant list in Zoom, I click on more beside my name, and then I have the option to rename. So I, I've decided I would prefer to have a written breakout room. So I put W in front of my name. If you prefer spoken, put S in front of your name. And we do ask that you choose one or the other because it helps us to sort you. Um, if you can't change it for any reason, we will message you just to try and figure out what you prefer as well. So don't stress too much if you can't find it. I think I've done all of the basic intro bits. Um, thank you to everyone who's included info on the icebreaker. Um, I can see Benshi with Worldwide Films for Kids with Age Recommendations, 3D Printers, a non-digital handwritten diary. I hope it's got a really nice cover, Malvika. Um, a smartwatch reminding you to stand up at least one an hour, once an hour. Nice, nice. <laughs> um, and Quizlet to learn German vocab. Ah, does Quizlet do do Spanish as well? Because I've been really enjoying my Duolingo Spanish and could use more ways to practice. I think it does everything, so it, it's worth trying. Nice. I shall take a look at this later. Uh, if anyone else wants to share any awesome apps, software, other interesting tools analog diaries, whatever it might be. There's still plenty of room, line 56, if you want to throw that in the etherpad, but it's never required. Um, also, welcome to everyone who's just joined uh, in the last few minutes. We're delighted to have you here as well. Um, I think I've done all of the intro stuff. And so I am going to ask Berenice to introduce me, which is a fascinating and weird thing. <laughs> Berenice, do you want Thank to take you. it away? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody. So we are in the first uh, cohort course about open science. So there will be three courses um, during the cohort about open science. And today we have the first one where we will have a short introduction about open science from you. So you, can you, you can I start? Will. Let me just do the screen sharing bits and pieces and store. Okay, click slideshow. That looks good. Share screen. Okay. Are you seeing the screen that I hope you're seeing? Excellent. Right. Uh, so as Berenice mentioned, this is the first time we are running through these slides. Um, we have, uh, well, I should say this more clearly, Berenice has looked at our open science lessons and she's done some really thoughtful thinking about changing it. So when I get stuck and stumble, please don't laugh too much and just be gentle. Um, anyway, open science. And I've added a little note here saying um, 
I don't want the word science to be exclusionary. Um, people, When people say open science, they usually mean research or scholarship, whether that be something that's counting as STEM or whether it's humanities or whether it's something else. Um, and when we say open science, we mean any type of sharing of open learning that we're working on. Uh, so we talk also very much about responsible and good uh, open research. Um, and I've actually just gently tweaked the slide a little bit last night uh, because we have a lot of quotes around good research practices. Um, but we thought we wanted to refine the term a bit more and maybe talk about uh, responsible research practices instead, because um, that allows a sort of level of reflection and thinking about what we're doing and is what I'm doing responsible when I do research. Uh, so we have quite a few different quotes from different uh, councils and various different bodies and things like that, talking about different ways to make sure that research is open, that it's responsible, that it's high quality. So here we have the Medical Research Council saying that high quality science is underpinned by uh, robust evidence base um, and by good or responsible research practices in this case. Um, and I would like to think that I'm a responsible scientist or a responsible researcher. And so I'm trying to think about the different types of responsible research that I could employ. Um, and if you think back, actually, also, we talk a lot in RLS about open by design. Um, I'll go as far as saying responsible by design um, and creating good research by design. So we, um, we, we take effort to make be responsible for what we do. So we're not going to arbitrarily picking a, a a, a thing here I don't know build a gun and then say I never thought about the bad consequences you should always be thinking about consequences on both sides respect the law I personally would actually put a tiny caveat by there and say there are sometimes laws that shouldn't be respected but within reason uh, respect the law uh, and ethical standards uh, and transparency I think this, uh, transparency and openness they're probably synonyms uh, but making sure that we tell people what we're doing, why we're doing it, or if there's reasons that we're not telling people why we're doing it, those need to be well thought out reasons as well. Um, and there are definitely reasons not to share things in some scenarios. Um, and our honesty is not only towards other researchers, but also towards the public. Uh, maximizing public benefit. I think probably if you're here on the call, it's super important to us that we actually um, recognize that the reason that we want to work openly is because we want to build on each other's shoulders, we want to help each other, and we don't want to be creating waste where we are not actually sharing the research that we're doing, and perhaps it's on a hard drive and then it gets lost and then we never see it ever again, which is an unfortunate easy default. Um, and then we try and spread that to other people as responsible researchers. We continue learning and we try and help other people learn, um, and through teaching usually we learn as well. Uh, and open science very specifically focuses on things like the transparency and the openness and the maximizing of the public benefit. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should share every single thing. So the Venn diagram of openness does not 100% overlap the Venn diagram of responsibility. Uh, for example, if I am a researcher who deals with conservation, it might be that I want to keep certain areas where the last known rhinos are secret rather than sharing them and allowing poachers to take them. Um, and it would be in fact irresponsible of me to actually share this, share this. Another scenario might be indigenous data where we know that many indigenous peoples have had uh, extractive histories where people um, have taken data and shared it maybe when they shouldn't have. Um, and very certainly medical records. Uh, no one wants to know what nasty disease I accidentally caught um, or rather maybe they do and I don't want someone to know that. <laughs> I do again but we should make sure that when we when we share things that we're thoughtful about what we share um so share when you could and don't and think carefully and don't share when you shouldn't and that's not always very clear sometimes a boundary is challenging uh and consent is important and sometimes something that maybe you can't share on your own if someone consents to being shared is okay uh, an example might be let's say open humans which allows people to share things like their genetic data but of course, that's not something you do unless people know exactly what they're walking into when they share their data. Uh, and Malvika actually shared a very nice little quote just the other day. Um, I couldn't help but capture and stick in a slide with some very nice curly green quotes. Uh, openness is holding the responsibility to be transparent, um, but we also need to make sure that we're protecting information when it is needed. So thank you, Malvika. We appreciate your concise wisdom on this one. Um, 
some more quotes that we have around what open science might be. Foster says that open science it makes scientific research accessible uh, to everyone in society and that we en enable unhindered access to scientific articles. So that certainly includes open access, but also data, collaborative research and many other things. Um, and also there can be a set of principles to make scientific research accessible to everyone. Wait, is this not the same one? It's similar, it's not the same. Watch me just get confused with a very similar quote, apologies. Making sure that uh, scientific knowledge is accessible, equitable and sustainable. I think those are super important. Um, it's unfair to uh, hold everyone to the same standards when the same standards may be unfair for, for different people. For example, if I said to a social scientist interviewing someone about sensitive topics, why isn't your data open? They'd say, well, that's breaching privacy. Uh, so different things are, um, required for equity think about that carefully um and people often view open science as a path with lots and lots of things that you may be able to share um and i'm struggling to uh, does anyone have any additional interpretations i'd like to add on this particular um <laughs> slide so why i put that is because i think usually we see open science with just data tools code and results and we miss a lot of things that are also important in open science, which come with the next slides. It was my. Thank you very much. That makes more sense. OK, I was like, yeah, I'm going to struggle to interpret this. I need, I need some help. Ah, pillars of open science. Right. Um, I was trying to rejig this diagram last night, and now I feel like it's a menorah of open science. Um, but this may be my uh, somewhat Jewish upbringing. Uh, so the seven open open uh, science pillars that we reference, and I think there's a few others as well, but this comes from uh, some previous literature talking about open data, open source, open methods, which I think wasn't covered in the previous diagram, possibly. I've got open data twice. What did I miss? Uh, open peer review, open access, um, which is sharing the art articles that we have, and open educational resources. Uh, there's a few others I'd like to throw out there, like open hardware. Maybe that's the double data. <laughs> uh, let, we'll, we'll figure out and fix that slide. Um, or UNESCO has a beautiful selection here of almost flower-like diagrams, which covers uh, open engagement of social actors, indigenous knowledge systems, evaluation, um, openness to all scholarly knowledge and inquiry, diversity of knowledge. Um, I don't know if I've missed any... Uh, but anyway, as Berenice said, we're going to have three three talks per call covering one uh, open science element each from this garden. Um, and we'll have discussions and reflections around open science practices. Um, so I think I've talked enough and gotten slightly confused only in one place, really. So I think we're doing good. I'm going to unshare. And uh, Berenice, back to you. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, Yo. Uh, if you have any questions to you, please uh, either unmute yourself or put them in the notes at the line 87. Um, and I don't know if any one of you have some question. Otherwise, we can, you can add your questions and we can answer them later also. That is something we can do. Um, otherwise, we plan a small exercise for you to reflect on that. Um, it's a small uh, silent reflection about two questions. Uh, which of the open science principles did you already know before today? And I will focus only on the UNESCO one because it's the one we will use everywhere. I should have uh, put them in the notes before. I now realize that I forgot to put them in. But um, which one of these open science principles did you already know before today? And which one did you already apply before today or participated in before today, before this talk, before this call today? Just mostly to reflect on this principle uh, there. And, and, then, and then we can move to some talks about, uh, about some of these principles today. So we will cover three principles today and then uh, three in in the other follow-up meetings. So in the line um, 96, you have uh, in the notes, you have questions and then you can answer them directly in the etherpads and then I can, we will, I will leave you a few minutes to reflect on that. And I will in the same times pass the, 
the principle in the etherpads also. I'm going to pause recording, but we need to not forget to start it again when we start talking. Yeah. You, do you take over the next one? Deal. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Berenice. Uh, it's really nice to facilitate the quiet conversations and notes that everyone had there. Uh, so, uh, Alexander, uh, we would like to uh, invite you to speak a bit about open evaluation as a JOS editor, um, as well as if anything you might wish to share about your experience with carpentries and decolonization in general. And is that a lot for 10 minutes? Take it away. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So let me share my screen. Uh, I guess... Now you can all see my desktop. If not, then please Perfect. shout. And then let me start the cuckoo timer. So this is an app which we used at an event last week a little bit, and this is what I recommended in an icebreaker. Okay, so, uh, right. So uh, first of all, uh, good morning, everyone. So thank you very much to you and to Open Life Science for inviting me here. It was quite on a short notice, so apologies for the quality of slide, which contains mainly uh, screenshots. I heard a lot about Open Life Science before, so I'm very excited to be here. And also I am touched to see here Ukrainian greeting, uh, Privit, since this is where I came to Scotland some years uh, ago. So before I did PhD in pure mathematics in Kyiv in Ukraine, and I started to contribute to open source mathematical software system, which is called GAP. And here I came to St. Andrews where a GAP development was coordinated. Now I'm a lecturer in School of Computer Science where I'm lead the research software group. I'm a fellow of Software Accessibility Institute an instructor and a trainer for the carpentries. So in this capacity, I uh, decided uh, to tell today about how open evaluation is implemented in a journal which is called JOS. So JOS, JOS is an abbreviation for a Journal of Open Source Software. Could you please raise hand in Zoom if you heard about JOS before? Yes, okay, uh, thank you. So uh, what is JOS? It addresses the problem of recognition of research software developers. It is developer-friendly journal. It is very cost-effective and it is open access. And it publishes short papers on research software. So uh, review is designed in a way that it improves not only the paper itself, but also the software as well. And the review is conducted using GitHub. I will tell a little bit more about the review procedure later. And as you can see in the bottom of the slide here, it is almost about 2,000 papers which were published by JOS since its inception in 2016. So another part of developer friendliness of JOS and its openness is extensive documentation. So for example, here you can see the author guides and reviewer guides. I posted all links in the other part, so you will be able to explore them uh, there. So here you can see the author guide. And this page lists submission requirements. So for example, software must be open source. It should be hosted in an sorry, uh, accessible location where users can uh, open issues and propose, propose code changes. It should have an obvious research application. The author should be a major contributor to the software. Uh, paper should not focus on new results, but focus on the software. And the uh, paper is written using markdown uh, format. Then uh, here on the next uh, slide, you can see the review criteria. And uh, they start with listing what, what a paper should include. So usually a paper in JOS is several pages long. And it should have a summary, <clears throat> a high level summary of the software, a statement which illustrates its purpose, describe how it compares with other commonly used packages in the area, and some other uh, things. And then uh, this page in the documentation shows the review uh, checklist. So I would say that JOS is not only uh, developer friendly, but it is also a reviewer friendly. Indeed, before becoming an editor of JOS, I reviewed several papers for this journal. 
And actually, the checklist, which is in the documentation, will be converted to a GitHub issue and a list of uh, tick boxes there. And then there is a lot of automation in JOS for various actions. For example, assigning an editor or reviewer, generating a checklist, creating PDF of a paper draft, accepting it for publication, and so on. So it works really, really uh, efficient. So now a little bit more to see the checklist. So what is actually included in reviewing uh, software uh, for or software paper for JOS? So you can see here, so I will not read everything. This is all on GitHub, so you can go and find those checklists uh, there. So just to give an outline here, uh, a reviewer uh, subscribes to the statement that uh, they will adhere to the code of conduct and declare that they don't have conflict of interest. Then there are general checks of a software. Does it have a repository? Does it have a, sorry, a, a license? Uh, does the author has contribu made contributions and is an author of the software? Does the software constitute a substantial score, scholarly effort? And then optionally, you need to do some checks about data sharing, about reproducibility, about research related with humans and animals, if, if this applies. Then <clears throat> the next set of uh, criteria is the functionality installation, functionality itself, performance, if any claims about performance are made in this uh, paper. Then uh, the reviewer will explore what documentation, uh, which documentation is available. Does it specify why there is a need of this software? Are there installation instructions? Are there usage examples? Uh, is functionality well documented? Are there any automated or at least manual steps uh, which uh, are described using which you can check that the software works, other community guidelines for potential contributors to the software. So it is expected that the reviewer will make attempts to actually install software and perform these <clears throat> simple instructions. And then finally, it's a paper, and then you need to check as a reviewer that it has summary, statement of need, state of the described state of the field, uh, has a uh, good quality of writing and includes a uh, reference says, as any uh, academic uh, paper. So uh, let's try to look at this at a meta level. So in fact, this is what we are doing is using publicly available GitHub repositories to review artifacts, right? In this case, artifacts are software and the paper, but it is completely plausible to envisage that you have a review workflow in which you are reviewing uh, some artifacts which are not even uh, software development projects. For example, some years ago, you see here, I had an attempt to set up a crowdsourced database of numbers for some mathematical objects. And they were available in this repository, and the emphasis was on provenance and reproducibility of results. So the guidelines explain that contributors are able to submit new entries using issues or pull requests. And a reviewer would try to reproduce these calculations uh, elsewhere on another machine. And there was some automation provided there in the form of scripts to generate reports and so on. Then uh, the final slide, another example of open review is the Carpentries. So Carpentries is a global community of volunteers which teach scientists modern skills for computational research. And Carpentry's training materials are collaboratively developed on GitHub. So basically, you contribute uh, main content in the form of Markdown, and then repositories also have various frameworks which will generate nicely looking static websites for these training materials, which are available for workshops and also available for self-study and so on. And then you can see in this image that uh, Carpentry started translation of these materials in some other languages. Uh, and translations are uh, unfortunately not public, so they are conducted on a tool which is used Transifex, to which you can log in, for example, using your GitHub credentials. Uh, but still, the results of the translations are again going back into public repository where people can review them as well. 
but of course people who participate in this translation project they can they work using this trans effects uh, tool and of course all of that is periodically synchronized with the uh, source and then uh, why uh, I would like to mention this uh, here so last year uh, after the beginning of the full-scale Russian invasion into Ukraine lots of scientists had to leave uh, Ukraine and then I initiated the project to translate carpentries into Ukrainian being inspired uh, by the very successful uh, translation of uh, carpentries material into Spanish so of course I think that such translations they will uh, help scientists who left Ukraine and need now possibly to find new jobs and acquire new skills to uh, do this faster because this is uh, what they will read in their own native language but also it will help to rebuild uh, Ukrainian science so uh, if you know anyone who is interested in this then please point them to this post on the website which I pasted here so at the moment we translated completely the uh, Python Gapminder lesson and it is currently under review and then we started to scale up our activities and uh, currently several more projects are in translation so uh, that's my 10 minutes so uh, thank you very much and which questions do you have Thank you so much, uh, Alexander. Can we please just have a quick round of applause? Um, Thank you. Thank you. Friends, if you have any questions, please drop them in. Um, I also very briefly want to highlight uh, that JOS, um, the review process, is one of the most delightful ones I've ever done. You've never had a paper review with emoji before. In JOS, there will be emoji. Um, and I would highly encourage going around and looking at some of the review issues because um, the review is completely, completely open. Um, and yeah, it's it's sparkling unicorns should be in all papers as far as I'm concerned. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so shall I unshare my screen? Yes, probably no. good timing. Yes. So I think we can do uh, one question. I'm just letting some typing come in. Uh, I know Berenice is pointing out we have a longer talk about the carpentries in week 12. Um, so we were just lucky to have Alexander here um, just briefly highlighting the fantastic translation, uh, which is semi open. Um, but Nikki says, has there been interest in using the JOS setup or process in other domains, i.e. to set up different journals? Mm. I think there is an idea of Journal of Open Educational Materials which roots from carpentries yes please Berenice you yeah I think there is already mm -hmm. the JOSI so mm -hmm. the Journal of Open Source Education is already running and there is another one I if I remember well that is also on the same uh, following the same idea as JOS uh, I mm -hmm. don't remember the name of it but there is definitely the education aspect yes mm -hmm. Thanks, Nikki uh, and Alexander and Berenice. Uh, for the sake of time, we're actually doing really well. But in order to not run behind, <laughs> I think we should move on to our next talk. Um, so uh, one last round of applause very much. Thank you, Alexander, for um, managing to fit in everything into the, the 10 minutes as well as Thanks. the questions. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So uh, we, next talk, we have to talk about open science infrastructures. And I'm delighted to introduce uh, Owen. Owen, would you like to take over from here? <clears throat> okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'll just share my screen and we get started. Um, right um so um sort of um i'm going to really talk about um open science and how it's progressing in, in recent times in in nigeria and i will touch a little bit on open 
uh, um, infrastructure. But I just want to sort of give everyone here kind of an, an, an idea of what's um, going on in, in, in Nigeria with regard to open science. And I, I love this first slide with all the welcoming hellos in the different languages. So hopefully we can add a few Nigerian languages to this slide um, moving forward. Um, my thanks to um, Emmy and her team for inviting me. This is my first time of being here. So um, um, I can see it's a very young audience, um, but I am very young at heart. So don't let my appearance um, distract you or fool you. Uh, my name's Owen Yoha, and I work for an organization in Nigeria called the Co-Connect Research and Education Initiative. And what we are, we are a national research and education network provider in Nigeria. I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with NRENS, but uh, we're an NREN operator in, in Nigeria. Um, and part of our remit is to deliver affordable connectivity to uh, institutions of higher education. So that would be our universities, polytechnics, and research institutes. And uh, on those networks provide other additional services that would um, enhance research collaborations locally and uh, internationally. And in the last, in recent years, in the last couple of years, we've become strong promoters and advocates of um, open science. Now that has come about because of our participation in um, an organization called Libsense, which is library support for embedded NREN services and e-infrastructure. It's a Pan-African movement and what it does is it brings practitioners from research and education, particularly librarians and researchers with uh, infrastructure providers like my, uh, my organization, NRENS, to discuss how we can enhance library and research practice around open science. Around open science. So the idea of LibSense is to be able to provide toolkits, and policy templates that different national uh, countries within Africa can adopt uh, for research practice and improving open science adoption. Now, in the case of Nigeria, um, this slide might be slightly outdated because it's these are data from about end of 2021, 2021. But there is a perception globally that the research outputs coming from Africa is very small or there's very little research going on. And uh, the, the wrong perception for that is because open science adoption and use of open access has been very low. And typically the cost for publications in high impact journals are prohibitive from an economic perspective in many African uh, countries. So there's this perception that there's not a lot of research that goes on within, within uh, Africa. And that's exacerbated by the poor uptake of open science, um, open access and use of other um, open paradigms. So uh, in order to sort of address this in Africa generally and in Nigeria specifically, LibSense has kind of three pillars that we work on to try to improve the adoption of um, open science. And these are advocacy and capacity building, uh, policy, um, documentation and implementation, then infrastructure, which is where my organization particularly focuses. Now, um, but we do part participate in some of these other pillars with uh, capacity building. So we engage in um, a lot of uh, workshops, uh, both online and physical. And um, we have an internship program as well that we run on campuses. And with those um, internship programs, we tend to look at having uh, project-driven learning that sort of leverages citizen science. 
So at the moment, we're engaged in a project with uh, students on a number of campuses uh, with our uh, girls projects where uh, girls were trying to improve the adoption of STEM by girls. And so we're using uh, Raspberry Pis and Python programming to build weather, weather stations that collect weather data and then that data is exported into repositories for further analysis and uh, weather, weather data. So these kind of activities we're hoping will lead to reinforcing um, the adoption of open science principles in our universities and uh, improve the practice um, generally. And of course, make more open science tools and infrastructure available to just drive uh, open science. Um, we actually organize annually a user conference and uh, in recent years, all our user conferences are heavily themed around um, open science. Um, so an example of some of the uh, capacity building we engage, engage in is even just sort of uh, digital literacy skills for digital transformation. So during the COVID, um, when the lockdown um, took place, we found that most of our universities were unable to really respond to the situation. And uh, we found out that many of our lecturers experienced, though they may be in their areas of expertise, had their digital skills were rather poor. And then when we now needed to sort of use more of online technologies for learning and teaching, some of the pedagogical uh, issues and uh, areas of course content with instructional design, these skills were lacking. Now, um, Echo Connect doesn't necessarily have those skills either, but through international partnerships, we're able to engage subject matter experts to help us with some of our webinars. So in this particular instance, we worked with uh, the NREN in the United Kingdom, which is called JISC, and uh, we had subject matter experts run a series of workshops in Nigeria to address digital literacy skills development and also identify areas that uh, needed to be um, addressed. And we typically do that and form partnerships with local and international experts to, to continue these kind of activities. Um, on the policy front, um, LibSense has developed a number of policy templates and um, we typically take those templates as a starting point for consultation meetings with uh, champions within our, our country or within the region and um, national stakeholders. These include our national education funders, some of the regulatory bodies around education who themselves need some awareness about uh, uh, open science and its, its benefits. And so we've been having an engaging in policy consultation meetings just to look at uh, open science policies and under open science are all the different um, areas of open science that need to be addressed, including open access and uh, some of the other areas that were mentioned by the previous speakers. Um, and the idea is to basically have a national policy document published this year for open science so that this uh, document coming from the government will be something that will be adopted by institutions with our universities and polytechnics. Um, we, we held a symposium about policy uh, last year and uh, we got some of our friends from the international space who are open science champions along with our local Nigerian stakeholders to sort of look at how to have our uh, policies put in place, taking our unique environments into consideration. And then the third pillar is obviously um, infrastructure, which is really uh, Echo Connect's core area. And so um, generally, uh, when you come to the global south, there is always the challenge of infrastructure within our education institutions. 
So um, open science itself was an opportunity for us to kind of look at where the infrastructure gaps existed typically among our universities and polytechnics and research institutes and try and see how we could bring our own expertise to provide um, open infrastructure that could uh, address some of this. And um, the way we've kind of uh, done that is to sort of build a kind of community driven um, open science cloud platform. The idea being that a lot of the uh, technologies and enabling infrastructures that allow our universities and our users within universities to start to use um, open source uh, technologies that are conforming with open science, they could actually access those resources and tools and implement uh, them through the open science cloud. So um, a typical uh, platform we have within the cloud is a publishing platforms open source software called Kotahi. And that would allow our researchers to be able to publish um, journals and preprints on local Nigerian infrastructure. And that obviously brings down the costs of making publications available when they try to go for global high impact uh, uh -huh. journals and journal platforms. And then what we do as well as maintaining the infrastructure we ensure that these uh, the content has the appropriate uh, persistent identifiers like digital object identifiers to ensure that there is uh, the global visibility that the scholarly outputs um, require. So that's just one of a number of um, platforms and software that is hosted within the within the cloud. Um, some of our upcoming activities are just uh, really ongoing activities from what I've um, previously described. Um, in July, we're having a meeting of uh, vice chancellors. Um, and what we're going to be doing with the, the vice chancellors is giving them a full demonstration of the full stack open cloud platform so they can see from an executive position the hope the benefits of being able to adopt uh, open open infrastructure to drive uh, the policies around open science and hopefully increase uh, research practice that is open science uh, driven. We are going to be formally la launching the uh, uh, weather project on a number of campuses where um, girls have been working together to build these weather stations uh, writing code in Python and using devices like um, Raspberry Pis um, and some other sensors that collect weather data to sort of collect this, this data, put them into open repositories for further publishing of weather data and, and analysis. So we, we kind of put that under the umbrella of um, citizen science. And uh, every third week of January, EcoConnect has its annual users conference. And like I said earlier, they're very heavily themed around open science. And so uh, we're looking forward. We just had uh, concluded the last one a couple of months ago. So uh, planning has actually started uh, for the January 2024 um, conference. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll be inviting some of you to uh, join us in that conference as well. Um, so like I said, it was really um, just a high level overview of um, what we're trying to do in Nigeria, in particular, um, and Africa in general. So I didn't go into too much details, but um, I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. Um, and uh, of course, during the breakouts, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Owen. Everyone, can we have a quick round of applause? Um, so I think we can maybe squeeze one question in uh, if we don't take too long. Uh, so either line 177, folks, if that's uh, easy for you. 
or you can pop it into the uh, chat. Thank you so much, Alexander. We really appreciate you coming. No worries that you have to drop. Um, and also, actually, Owen, I think I know about 10 people who should be talking to you if they're not already talking to you. I really, really enjoyed that presentation. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. So I'm going to quickly just ask uh, Owen, have you met anyone from Methodocentia? Um, I don't think so. Doesn't so um... the reason I ask uh, when you were describing um, that during lockdown suddenly people had to figure out uh, pedagogy, online pedagogy. Um, that is the reason that Metadocencia became an organization in the um, in Spanish speaking America. So I imagine there's a lot of similarities around the types of things that you've had to do. Um, from different angles, one being Latin America um, and one being more African and Nigerian. Um, I'm going to move on, I think, just so that we make sure we have time for everything and for our last speaker, Umar, who um, actually I think we have quite a few Nigerians on the call today. Quite good. Um, so one last big round uh, of applause. Thank you so much, Owen. Uh, we have a breakout room and then we have um, the final presentation. Uh, Bechene, so I'll pass it back to you to introduce the room while I try and do the yes. presentation. Yeah, so now we have a short discussion. So we will have breakout rooms where uh, the idea is to discuss about open research. Um, and there is few discussion points in that we put in the line 180, 184. Do you think research, uh, scientific research is open? If yes, how is it open? Why do you call it open? If you will not call it open, why not? Uh, how can we, do we call it then closed science? And um, yeah, some questions, prompt question about your feeling about uh, research and scientific research. Um, it's just a starting discussion for you in the room. So it's just a, that in discussion, mostly of that. I think we can cut it maybe to 10 minutes to be sure that we have the time afterwards for, for the next presentation. So let's say at 10 minutes, uh, we open the, the rooms for 10 minutes. Uh, please be sure that you have your name. Uh, sorry, yeah, Uma, do you have something? Oh, it's after the breakout session. That I'm yeah, presenting. you are after the breakout session. Is it okay? No problem. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, perfect. Um, be sure that you have a W or a S before your name so that uh, you can put you in the correct breakout rooms. Um, and um, we put some notes, so please feel free to put notes in the in the menu in the notes afterwards about during the breakouts uh, of your discussions. You is it? Do you need a few more? Uh, no, we're good. I'm going to assign you all. Okay. Uh, so hopefully everything was clear and we will see you in 10. And remember, if you need assistance, cl click, uh, please click on ask for help button. Sorry, I should have said that before sending everybody to breakout rooms. <laughs> um, Umar, I didn't know if you wanted to go into a breakout room since you're coming up to your talk or whether you would prefer to wait outside. Uh, I can join you. Okay, Sorry. I'll send you. Uh, spoken or written? Uh, spoken. Spoken. Cool. I'm sending you. Am I? Okay, welcome back from the breakout room. I hope you had nice discussions during the breakout and you could, uh, yeah, engage and discuss about the uh, open research, uh, your feeling about open research. Um, and your experience about that. Um, I will not go too much uh, over the notes, so everything is on the etherpad, so you can have a look at what the other breakout rooms discussed together. Um, and then we, I will end in to uh, Jafsia. Can you to introduce the last speakers? Yeah. Good. Thank you so much, Berenice. Uh, 
after her introduction of you to open science. And uh, Alexander took us through the publication and review process of the Just Journal. Uh, let me tell you that uh, I'm advocating to the Guinness record to grant him the award of the most cool, simple, and paternal person I met since the beginning of this year, 2023. Um, we also learned how a co connect in Nigeria is deploying open science infrastructure to connect the unconnected and empower people in digital literacy. Uh, now we'll stay in Nigeria again to listen to my neighborhood brother and friend, Umar Farouk, about open engagement of social actors. Farouk, you have the floor. Hello. We hear you. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Japsia, my mentor for OLS 6 for the prayer introduction. Uh, and I'm just about to share my screen. Can everyone see the screen? Oh, that's perfect. Good morning, everyone, and thanks uh, for inviting me today. Uh, I'm here to talk uh, about the importance of open engagement of social actors. Sorry. Uh, here is uh, the outline for the presentation. Uh, in today's world, we face a variety of complex challenges from climate change and social inequality to political polarization and economic instability. Uh, these challenges require us to work together across sectors and boundaries to find creative and effective solutions. Therefore, open engagement of social actors can help us just do that by creating opportunities for dialogue, collaboration and collective action Open engagement can help us build more inclusive and sustainable cities. In this presentation, I will define key terms, provide examples of successful open engagement initiatives, and also give us a time to reflect on questions regarding what the future holds. I hope that by, end, by the end of this presentation, we will all have a better understanding of the power of an open engagement and be inspired to get involved in creative, in creating positive change. These are the key terms, even though you was able to share some in her presentation. One is uh, openness. In open engagement, openness refers to the principle of making research and data openly available accessible and usable by others. That is what we call transparency, which is the practice of making research processes and outcomes transparent so that others can understand how the research was conducted and replicated if needed. There is the act of community which refers to the group of people who share a common interest or goal, such as scientific community. There is what we call diversity and inclusion, which promote, diverse, which promote uh, scientific research by actively recruiting participants from underrepresented groups and creating a supportive and inclusive environment. Uh, these days, there is a saying that your network is your net worth. And uh, networking is so essential as defined as the exchange of information and ideas among people with a common profession or special interest. And this goes usually in an informal setting because people tend to be free and relaxed when it is done informally. And there is uh, mentorship. 
mentorship by providing guidance and support to early career researchers to help them develop their skills and advance their careers. Some of uh, examples of successful initiatives are the participation of youth at uh, the last year's United Nations Conference of Parties, Conference 27, where youth came together under the banner of nuclear for climate to advocate for nuclear energy as a solution for climate change. The young nuclear advocates include students, researchers, and professionals from countries such as South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and Egypt, and also all around the world. The young nuclear advocates from Africa highlighted the potential for nuclear energy to provide reliable and affordable electricity to communities that currently lack access to energy, particularly in rural areas. Uh, by the end of uh, COP27, these young people from almost 30 countries uh, made sure that uh, nuclear power has been included uh, in the final document for COP27 as clean energy, which previous COPs from the first one to this 27th one uh, were not able to uh, do. This shows the power of open engagement and uh, inclusion of social actors. There is uh, what we are talking on, uh, the open life science. Uh, the open life science uh, is a 16 week mentorship like you all know. And now you are in the seventh cohort, and there are participants from all uh, over 50 countries. And uh, apart from uh, Amy uh, and uh, Yo, recently there has been inclusion of Kamil, uh, Dev, Jilaga, and also Tajuddin from Nigeria also. And uh, OLS use community driven approach, open communication, and also diversity and inclusion. Uh, to emphasize the importance of open community, uh, uh, to create supportive and collaborative community for early, early career researchers who are committed to promoting open uh, research. So I'm going to give us time to re reflect on uh, this. Uh, to, there are upcoming initiatives such as the radical inclusion, advocating for involvement, of all people in conferences and so on. Uh, and also, uh, I would like to ask us this question that what the future holds for open engagement? Thank you for listening. Thank you, Omar, for your brilliant presentation. I don't know if there are some questions in the audience, please feel free to ask the question to Omar. I'm going to suggest, since we have a couple of minutes, should we um, maybe in the notes, line 263, we could respond to Umar's question around what's, um, could you just restate that question for us, Umar? Uh, the question is, uh, what does the future hold for open engagement uh, of social actors? I'll pause the recording for just a minute if anyone wants to suggest what they might hope that the future will hold uh, in 9264. So then I can start again saying thanks all the speakers for this first open science uh, course from the OLS7 uh, course. It was really a nice, uh, yeah, nice talks, nice uh, thinking about uh, open science elements. So we covered this this week, open science infrastructure, open engagement of social actor, open evaluation. 
in the next uh, in the week 10 so we will have the second open call uh, open science call and where we will cover open source software open hardware and open desk to diversity of knowledge and the week 12 uh, then we will for, uh, talk about open data open access publication and open education resources so yeah that is the plan for the next two uh, open science calls uh, the some of assignments so please check uh, so we had last week a github introduction uh, call so Malvika run that uh, if you are interested in, in learning more about uh, github but you couldn't join the course the video is available online on youtube you can also check the the notes for all the links interesting so if you want to get familiar with github and um, if you never uh, work with it and you are interested in, in learning about that um and you can also uh start uh prepare to share your project online using github pages or google site wordpress or any option that sounds interesting for you um yes but do it at your own pace i think that is uh make what you can when you when you have the time and you are um uh, you, you have the time and availability not just time uh, there the next week, so next week, week seven, uh, you have uh, you should have a um, call with your mentor. And week eight, we have a court calls about uh, community design for inclusion. So that are that is a plan for the next two weeks. If you have any questions after the call, please uh, uh, you can put them on the line uh, three hundred one. Uh, after that, and uh, we would also value all your feedbacks um starting in line 305 especially because uh, as we said we are reshaping this course so this open science course and any feedbacks on that would be really interesting for us to to see if it's um if this code ran, uh, ran well what you would change uh, what is something uh uh what didn't work uh, and what surprised you? That are the four questions that we asked you in the feedback starting on line 304. And we will really value that for, for learning for the next course, what we can do better maybe, or differently at least. And on that, I will say we are sharp in time. I would say peel in time. I mean, I'm mixing French and, and, and English. It's really great. And so we are sharp in time. Thanks a lot, everybody, for participating. Uh, thanks for all the speakers and hope to see you in the next court. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye, beautiful humans. Bye. Bye bye.